for several years with crude oil trains. And this happened overnight with absolutely no public input. No citizen in our county knew that this was happening. In fact, many of the city council members had no idea what was happening. And that was because this industry down at Fort Westward that was bought by Global Partners. It was originally meant to be an ethanol plant. And the county poured lots and lots of money into the ethanol plant that never produced one drop of ethanol. And they went out of business. And Global Partners came in. They took their permit, existing permit for ethanol to the DEQ and said, would you please change this so we can ship crude oil? And DEQ said, sure. And they put their stamp of approval on it. And all of a sudden, 100 unit cars of crude oil started coming through our county. Then of course, you know, there was the big explosion in Canada. And that really set people on fire in our county, because for one thing, the crude oil trains go by every school in Scappoos, and most of the schools in St. Helens and Rainier. So this was a really huge issue. Global Partners needed to go to DEQ and ask for a bigger permit. They needed to be able to ship more crude oil and so they had to have hearings at this time. So all of us went. Many people were going to hearings for the very first time. Many people going with the understanding that they got from their education that they were going to be heard. This was a hearing. DEQs were the good guys. They wanted the best for us. They wanted the best for the environment. So people went and they testified. And here's how they set up the room. DEQ sat back here. The chair was here. And when you came up to testify, you sat in this chair and you talked to the people who were also there to testify. They were back there. They weren't even listening. The woman who was the head of the meeting that night sat and looked at her smartphone all evening long. So that was only one hearing we went to. And by the time we'd gone to four or five within the county, the county again, just like the movie saying, nothing we can do. There is nothing we can do, our hands are tied. And that's when we found Paul. And we began to ask these questions, what can we do? And Paul came out and he put on a democracy school. And it was one of the most eye-opening experiences I've ever had. It was, it was like, I didn't even know what country I grew up in. I had no idea what the real laws were. I didn't know the process of how laws got changed to favor corporations. And at the end of the, the democracy school, we decided to heck with going to hearings. This isn't getting us anywhere. And Paul was kind enough to introduce us to CELDA. And we worked for a year putting together an initiative, a sustainable energy future initiative. And the purpose of it being to establish a community bill of rights and also to have some control over being able to stop things corporate harm, like crude oil trains. So the interesting thing about it was we wrote the initiative, and again we went into this really euphoric stage where we thought, well, now here we go. So we take the initiative down and we file it with the county. And the rule is that then the public has seven days to, um, to challenge the initiative. Well, it never occurred to us that anyone 
even would. How would they even know? Who would even know we put the initiative in? Sure enough, somebody challenged the initiative. And they just happened to be a person who probably is not even as wealthy as most of us sitting in this room, who just happened to also be able to be represented by one of the largest law firms in Portland, Davis Wright Tremaine. And they took this to court. And so they challenged the, um, the purpose of the initiative. And our lawyer was Ann Neelan, the woman that you saw um, from the Willamette Valley. And this was one of the most exciting things I've ever been involved in because here's little Ann, and here's this great big corporate lawyer, and they come into the courtroom in um, St. Helens, and she proceeded to absolutely eat his lunch in the nicest way possible. And he was not at all prepared to have a real challenge. And we were very fortunate. We had a very sympathetic judge and the corporate lawyer was basically saying everything in here is against the law you can't possibly okay this because it's not lawful and the judge said well that may be true but that's for another day this is an initiative if the initiative gets passed there may be another problem and there may be another court case. But for right now, this is about do the people of Columbia County have the right to put in this initiative? And I say, yes, they do. So, yeah, it was, it was thrilling. It was just thrilling. But then what was not so thrilling was afterwards, shortly afterwards, the crude oil trains quit running. And they quit running because the price of crude oil went down to the point where it wasn't financially feasible for global partners to spend the money to ship the oil halfway across the country and to Port Westwood to then be barged out to be refined. So they switched their permit, they went back to DEQ and said, oh, would you take this crude oil permit and would you turn it back into an ethanol permit? And the DEQ said yes, and they stamped it, and now we're getting ethanol trains coming through. So ethanol is now coming down the track. But un unfortunately, for people who live in the county, the big threat now feels to them as if it's over. And that's the challenge that we're up against right now. To convince the people in the county that yes, for this short period of time, the threat is over, but they'll be back. And, and it's more than just crude oil. It's the Community Bill of Rights. Do you ever want to have this happen to us again? Do you want to be able to make a difference do you want to be able to say yes or no to corporations who want to do you harm? They promise they'll only do you just a little bit of harm. And if they do a whole lot of harm, harm, they're just going to say, we're oh so sorry, we never saw this could possibly ever happen, as they said in Canada. And so this is where we are. We're out collecting signatures, and we're having a bit of a tough time trying to convince are our people that they need to support this because here's another thing that i personally object to to the bottom of my feet is the fact that this always happens in rural communities that are very poor the majority of people 70 percent of the people who live in scapoos work in portland and the people who work in columbia county do not make good wages for the most part and they're desperate, and they see any job as a job that's needed. And what happens is they begin to pit, the corporations successfully pit, the environmental concerns with the people who are struggling to make a living. So I would like to ask all of you here, 
tonight if you'd be willing to come out and help us in this effort. We need to strongly make a strong showing. We need to have lots of people standing on corners, taking signatures, but even more than getting the signatures is telling the story. And I would assume that you probably feel pretty good about what you saw tonight. And we need to translate what you now know to be true into action. And it's right here, and it's only 20 miles away. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. It's really exciting for me to know that so close to Portland, a community rights campaign has been formed, which is one county away. Clapscanai County, Clapscanai, Columbia County, Clapscanai, St. Helens, Rainier, those are the towns, some of the towns. Scapoos. Scapoos. Um, you may not even know that there's a rural county right next to Multnomah County. But um, they're going gangbusters and they need your support. So I've just passed around a sheet of paper. If you can imagine committing a day going out there to help them collect signatures by July, August. by August, um, you would be doing a huge uh, service to their community and to the community rights movement. There are something like uh, six or eight active counties, some active currently, some in the past, in Oregon, um, that have worked uh, to pass community rights ordinances. Corvallis and Eugene's counties have um, unsuccessfully so far attempted to pass the right to a local food system ordinance. Uh, Josephine County, which is Grants Pass Kid Junction, unsuccessfully so far has tried to ban uh, pesticide spraying, aerial pesticide spraying on forest land by corporations. Um, there's a big, exciting campaign brewing in Coos County, um, North Bend Coos, Coos Bay, where an LNG, what was originally claimed to be an LNG export plan uh, after the permit was achieved, turned into an LNG import plan. Um, and they're wanting to put something like 150 miles of pipeline, liquefied natural gas pipeline, which is incredibly dangerous, um, across a very complicated landscape. If you can imagine the hilly landscape that goes from Coos Bay east across the mountains towards I-5, as well as uh, liquid, LNG is liquefied natural gas, LNG uh, terminal um, on, in Coos Bay. Um, and there's a wonderful campaign going on in Coos Bay. I'm forgetting the name of the uh, campaign. What's the, do you remember the website? I'm blanking on. Well, it's the major, and no, I don't remember. Oh, Coos Commons. Coos Commons. Coos Commons, C-O-O-S, commons.org is their, is their website. And they're on the ballot next Tuesday in our state primaries um, that would ban uh, the LNG pipeline and the LNG terminal uh, in Coos County. Um, it's, it's probably the most serious campaign uh, that the Oregon Community Rights Movement has managed to run so far. It has a reasonable chance of winning, um, and something like $350,000 has been thrown against it, 90% uh, of which is from the corporation that's wanting to put in the LNG infrastructure. And they have their own fake um, AstroTurf organization, forgetting what its name is, I don't know if you remember, um, to try to convince the public that this horrible thing would actually be good for them. The Friends of Jordan <coughs> the, the pro, the, the corporate front group, Friends of Jordan Crow, which is not touchy feely. I know. So, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, in Portland, we've had a group that has stopped being active in the last year called Community Rights PDX. And we have a website that is not as active as it needs to be, communityrightspdx.org. Um, but a number of us have just started working again on something that we're calling a housing bill of rights that would be run as a city ballot initiative in Portland or in Multnomah County that would start to protect renters, uh, homeless people and people uh, who are threatened by foreclosure. So housing in all those three categories to run an actual ballot initiative to start addressing the growing housing crisis. So if you're interested in 
a housing bill of rights idea as a community rights ballot initiative locally, um, you might be interested. This is our brand new organization that's launching officially in just a week or two. And the website went up a few weeks ago. If you just put a dot before US, you've got our website, communityrights.us. Um, a new national support organization. I'm the uh, program director and lead trainer of the new organization. And uh, I've been doing this work now for more than 20 years, leading workshops all over the United States. Um, I just wanted to remind you all what it says in our state constitution in Oregon, because it's one of the last remnants of the American Revolution written down in law that's still relevant and current. Here's Article 1, Section 1 of the Oregon State Constitution. Bill of Rights, natural rights inherent in people. We declare that all power is inherent in the people and all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. And they have at all times a right to alter, reform, or abolish the government in such manner as they may think proper. We the people have the, have the authority constitutionally in Oregon to alter, reform, or abolish our government in such manner as we may think proper. So it's the idea that there's such a thing as the consent of the government. And as you saw in the film, community after community across the United States, there is no consent of the government. And in that situation, the government is no longer legitimate. And so the question becomes, what do we the people do when our government is structurally no longer legitimate? What does it mean for us to come to reimagine ourselves not just as single issue activists or as consumers who vote with our dollars, but as we the people. What does it feel like? What is it, what happens differently in our heads? What is a full embodiment experience as for us to imagine ourselves? I mean, none of us really knows that, right? What does it actually mean? For most of us, we don't even think of ourselves as included in the concept of we the people because most of us feel really hopeless and powerless about the state of the world. And so in our work in Community Rights US and in my workshops that I lead all over the United States, um, that's really the focus. Is it's not just the ordinance uh, campaigns that the film so ably covered, but it's also the essential culture shift work that is so necessary to be doing. That we step out of this isolated, single issue sense of hopelessness and powerlessness and in this regulatory system that is really designed to, to tie us up in knots and make us irrelevant and into a whole different kind of embodied um, citizenship. Um, I just want, the last thing I wanted to say is I brought um, my colleague Jan, who's in the very back row there, um, has some really key books on the community rights movement that are available for sale if you want to walk out with more details about this movement, I'll just very briefly tell you what's here. Um, we the People, Stories from the Community Rights Movement of the United States. This is stories from communities, not activist folks, but folks who just rose up and realized they needed to change the way they were trying to challenge corporate harms. A DVD from Thomas Lindsay, who's one of the speakers tonight, and others reclaiming democracy. Two hours of talks, Q&A on community civil disobedience in the name of sustainability, the community rights movement in the United States. This is kind of the long range strategy document of our movement. If you have an interest in the legal aspects of this work, this is the people's right of local community self-government. This is an actual legal brief defending an ordinance that was passed in Grant Township, Pennsylvania a year ago where it's been sued by an energy company. So if you're curious what a legal defense of an ordinance looks like, that's that. And the last thing is Gaveling Down the Rabble, um, which is this wonderful book of stories about how the Supreme Court has ended up being used as the mechanism to allow corporations to gain so many constitutional rights. Um, and I also have a handful of CDs of my nationally broadcast talks also in the back. So if you're interested in that, chat with Jan in the back. Um, and we should take questions or comments. There's a microphone here.
The challenge is a little bit complicated to explain, but I'll try to be brief. Of the approximately 10 towns that have been sued, uh, most of those towns, the town or city or county council, went into private session either at the threat of a lawsuit or an actual lawsuit. And in private session with the public not welcome to participate, they were scared and they took the law off the books to avoid the lawsuit. Rather than, as you can see, we're not afraid of lawsuits in this movement. The lawsuit is part of both the political education of the community to help the community realize that corporations actually do have more rights and authorities than we do, even in our own communities, and we need to create kind of an uprising, a waking up process. Um, so it, it doesn't help the movement at all when you get scared and take it off the books. And what's interesting is that um, what more and more of these communities are understanding that we have to get past the fear of being sued, both as citizens and as elected officials. I think there's something to add about that. Well, and that was certainly our case, you know, right out of the chute with our brand new initiative, we get challenged immediately. And it's this fear, I mean, it's a genuine reaction because, you know, as Thomas Lindsay says, we are conditioned to think, oh man, I'm I'm pushing the envelope here. I'm doing something I shouldn't do. And instead, after we you know, took a deep breath, we said, no, this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. This is what good citizens of this country do. When there is something wrong, you challenge it, and you challenge it lawfully. So we, um, we passed the hat, and we got enough money together to call Ann Neeland, and of course, like all community rights workers, I mean, she works um, for a lot less than Davis Wright Tremaine, let me say that, and, and so without her, we wouldn't have been able to afford it, but she made it possible, and she made such an impression. It was such a really wonderful thing for us to see how it works when you go to court. And once the challenge was defeated, it's just, it's like, okay, that's only one hurdle. Now we're gonna get it on the ballot, and then if we get it passed, we'll get challenged again. And that's where the real trouble will come, because the county will say, we can't okay this, we can't let you do this, because we will get sued, the county will get sued. And that's where, the education part of it is so important because just like I was led to understand how it works, that's how everybody is led to understand how it works. So just collecting the signatures and just getting on, on the ballot isn't enough. We have to be educated how to be proactive, 
good citizens on our own behalf. Other questions or comments? Yeah, can you come to the mic? So that yeah, I just wanted to, I, I couldn't control. really hear that well. The enunciations, I didn't get a lot of times on the film. Um, okay, the woman in Pennsylvania with all the fracking, um, um, the uh, name of Jake's pumps, did, did they stop that fracking there? All those pumps yeah. just dried up. Yeah, the emergence. That was Tish O'Dell. Who With the blonde hair. Broadview yeah, Heights. They, oh. They, they were defeated. Yeah, the Tish O'Dell, their, their movement did end up being defeated in court. Uh, but the, the woman who was the nurse about the sludge, that was effective. No, the one way with the blind hair. That, that movement, no, movement. that initiative did not get passed. It didn't get passed. So that so meant that, that, that no, meant not they continued the fracking in, our, in and around her town. Yes, they continued the fracking, yes. And right now, uh, in Colorado, they have the same thing going on. And, and they are, really, they benefited tremendously from what uh, Trish went through. And so the community rights group gets together. We learn from each other what's effective and what isn't. And Colorado, who is faced with just as big a fracking problem as any place in the U.S., is mounting a really strong, really um, uh, in-your-face campaign because these uh, fracking wells are everywhere. They're in every suburb. They're, they're right outside of every playground in, in school areas. I mean, it is so unavoidable to see what is happening. And it's going to be real interesting to see how it ends up in Yeah, Colorado. I mean, I saw your uh, film, how many of them exist. It's unbelievable. And that is just a part of, of what is possible and what is actually going on in the U.S. And right they're now. Toxic. They're so toxic. Mm -hmm. They are. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and, and what's really exciting that's happening in Colorado is that Colorado is one of the few states in the United States where you can actually amend your state constitution through the ballot box. And so there's a state constitutional amendment being proposed by the Colorado Community Rights Network um, that would make it illegal for corporations to sue local communities that are simply trying to protect their own health and welfare. So again, it starts to change that balance of power. So the initial step in this movement is hundreds initially and hopefully soon thousands of communities, towns, cities, and counties passing our ordinances. And then once enough communities in a state have passed them, they form a state community rights network and they start taking on the structures of law in the state. You heard about Dillon's rule and state preemption in the film that make it illegal for a local government to protect its own people, right? It's illegal under current structures of law. So when you take on the state constitutional structures, you can start changing those legal structures. And then once enough states, and so there are now I think six active state community rights networks. Colorado is probably the most active, um, and Oregon has a, has a state community rights network. And then once enough state community rights networks have formed, they form, and the film talks about this very briefly, a federal community rights network that starts taking on these structures of law at the federal level that violate our rights, that give corporations more constitutional protections than we the people have. So we're not, it's not a movement where we're assuming we're gonna win Courts. So that's what makes us really different. We're not afraid of the courts. We're not afraid of losing. We're expecting to lose. But we the people are sovereign over our government. The government is required to serve us. It has duties and responsibilities to us. That includes the judicial branch of the government. So there are communities that are starting to use nonviolent direct action to enforce local laws that have been passed in their communities, even when the state and the corporate structures say, we're not gonna abide by your local law because it's illegal or it violates our rights. Their communities starting to write into their local ordinances the right to protect the ordinance through nonviolent direct action 
against the corporation as a, as a function of enforcement, right? Because we the people have the authority if we believe we do, right? The change is in here. That's what's so bizarre about this movement, right? Is that it's not that we have anyone to plead with. There's no one to plead with. We have to change what we think about the proper relationship between we the people and our subordinate government institutions and our subordinate corporate institutions. How do we rearrange that relationship? And I would actually disagree with you because I do not expect to lose in court. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Any okay. other questions? Yeah. I, I'm going door to door um, for um, uh, the rising rents. I'm a tenant, and um, we're going. Um, I'm working with CAT Community Alliance with the tenants, and we're going um, this Wednesday again and talking to people, um, trying to get them to sign and talk to Senator Rod Monroe, who is a landlord. And we find out there was an article in the Willamette Weekly. The, uh, the senators that are voting on this bill 2004, that all of them are landlords. So it's all a conflict of interest with uh, the landlords. They're, uh, they're, um, they don't want rent control. They, they tell tenants that rent control is bad for them. You know, and um, I don't know. Well, that's, you know, that's where, good for you for getting out there and for being proactive, but that's where having to beg for what you need and what is right just doesn't work. And we've been through it for too long, especially those of us who grew up in the 60s. You know, we've been doing this for a long, long, long time. It's never worked. Yeah, they're this raising, you want to raise $400, 500 Right, right, yes. I appreciate that work you're doing. Uh, that'll be supporting uh, my ex-counselor's bill. So Karen Power uh, wrote HB 2004, which is the bill you're talking about, oh, trying really? to push through the Senate. Um, I have a question about your lawsuit, your or your uh, measure. measure. What you'll be trying to affect is the railroads, right? Well, actually, it's much more much more far-reaching than that. So what we are saying is that when this passes, the county will create an agency made up of specialists in, in fossil fuels and in renewable energy, and there will also be citizens on the panel, and it will be overseen by the um, county commissioners. But it will be that we will no longer allow any more fossil fuel building in our county. Doesn't mean we won't have gas for our cars. Doesn't mean you won't be able, no, nothing that we have now will stop, but nothing new will be added. And that instead, everything new that will be added must meet sustainability requirements. Right, so we, we've been talking about um, a fossil fuel, no, no new fossil fuel infrastructure uh, ordinance, but what we're wrestling with is that still gives us no control of the railroads. The railroads are apparently a oh, power right. unto themselves. Yeah, we could talk all the rest of tonight about the railroads. Yes, you are right, and no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Within conventional lawmaking, yes. we have no control over the railroads. Yes. The Interstate Commerce Commission, you know, makes certain claims about it. It's, it's the back in the regulatory box again. What community rights ordinance locals are claiming is that once again, that is a structure of law that fundamentally violates our rights as the sovereign people because it subordinates the rights of people under the rights of corporations. Therefore, it's legitimate. Therefore, a local community has the authority through a community bill of rights to nullify that structure of law within the local community. That doesn't mean that a judge is going to agree with that argument, but that's what the entire movement is doing. 
right? Each of the locals is challenging laws that, that are officially over us, but which we're nullifying within our local, our local jurisdiction as a violation of our rights. And you could be doing that in Milwaukee. And I will say that because we're not stopping it, we're not saying no, that you can't have anything. Like right now, we have ethanol. And if this board decides that it has to, that it can meet our requirements, they could allow, continue to allow uh, ethanol to be brought through the county. But if they say no, they can't, they won't be saying no to the railroad. They'll be saying no to global partners. So the railroad won't even be involved. They will just not have the business anymore because global partners will be restricted from bringing it in through this legislation. So we're hoping that we can eliminate getting in a fight with the railroads because they have the deepest pockets and the best um, protection under the law of anyone. No one can beat the railroad when it comes to lawful protection. They, they, they hold all the cards. Right. So, so Paul, is, is the basic concept of essentially reach some sort of uh, point of saturation of cities that have, have uh, passed this, that we can somehow cause a shift at the federal level? That the, I mean, well, yeah, ultimately, I'm, I'm wondering about ending. Right? Sure, so ultimately that? we're going to end up with brave state judges that start to challenge these structures of law. There's one so far in Pennsylvania court. Um, I actually am ready to read you a quote from her decision. Um, and then beyond that, we're going to ultimately want to see federal, the federal judiciary system taking on these, these structures of law as illegitimate as a violation of our constitutional rights. But I think the, that's where most activists usually go is, don't we need the courts to affirm this? Well, yes, ultimately that's where we need to go. But in the process of that, we need to learn how to overrule the courts through citizen authority, through actual, with our bodies, as citizens, saying we pass the law locally, if you're not going to abide by the law, we will be out in force to make sure you can't put in the pipeline, you can't run the trains through our communities, etc. And that is actually starting to happen in movement, where enforcement becomes something that we define as we the people. Right? Here's, here's a, a brief excerpt from a judge in Pennsylvania a couple of years ago, uh, Judge Debbie Odell Seneca, who took on a corporate rights issue and for the very first time ruled in our favor, she said, this is a tiny bit of her decision, it's axiomatic that corporations, companies, and partnerships have no spiritual nature, feelings, intellect, beliefs, thoughts, emotions, or sensations, because they do not exist in the manner that humankind exists. They cannot be let alone by government because businesses are but grapes ripe upon the vine of the law that the people of this commonwealth raise, tend, and prune at their pleasure and need. Therefore, corporations are subordinate. And she's going back to what actually was the law and the culture in the United States from the American Revolution right through most of the 1800s, where we understood culturally and legally that corporations were our subordinates and that we had the authority to define what they did and prohibit them from causing harm. So this is not some crazy 21st century notion. We actually have this in our history for most of the first century. Thanks. I know, Paul, that you moved to Portland in part because you thought this would be very fertile ground. Uh, I'm going to guess you moved here 10 years ago? Six. Six? Okay. Um, it hasn't worked out very well. Do you have any insight as to why Portland hasn't, done, hasn't developed this as you hoped? That's an interesting blood question. Um, 
I'm just all curious. <laughs> I have a number of ideas about this. Um, the, the folks at, the, at Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, early on in my work, um, 10, 15, 20 years ago, said, don't bother working in progressive cities. Get out into conservative rural areas and do this work. Um, we didn't say this, and the film doesn't make this clear, but the vast majority of these 200 communities are rural conservative communities, Republican and Libertarian communities. Republicans and Libertarians in rural communities understand the value of local control. Progressives and liberals and greens in urban communities tend, up until the Trump administration, to believe in federal environmental protection to protect them from those other local people that they are cohabiting with. Um, and so, from Selda's perspective, don't bother with progressive communities. They don't get local control. And I think that that's part of what is happening. I also think that the environmental activism and the labor rights activism that happens in Portland, there are so many groups, and they're all so stuck in the regulatory system. It went by really fast, but there was a quote where somebody said, the primary purpose of, of environmental regulations is to regulate environmentalists. I don't know if you caught that. That's really true. The primary purpose of labor regulations is to regulate workers. It's not to regulate harm. These are systems that are designed to tie us in knots. And in my six years of close to full-time organizing in the community rights movement in Portland, with an active group for two or three of those six years, we found it very difficult to get conventional activists to take this stuff seriously. Um, and yet I travel all over the country to you know major audiences, packed workshops. But here in Portland, it's really difficult to get an audience. And that's about all I can mm -hmm. say. Is people are too busy, and life is good in Portland. <laughs> Good, easy, liberal Portland. If you're, especially if you're a privileged white skinned person. Do you have any, do you have any insights into Portland? Well, before moving to Scampoos, um, I lived in Los Angeles, where it's hard to get anything done because it's so enormous. And then moved to Portland and felt, you know, that this is really, this is it. This is great. But exactly like you say, there, it, it's very uniform and it's very conformed in the way in which you can um, be a rebel. So you've got to be a rebel in the right way and follow the right rules. And it's really no different anywhere. You know, we, we have this mindset, but it pulls absolutely right. We went to the Democratic Party we went to all of the, the political parties in the county when we first came up with the initiative. And the Democrats poo-pooed us, the Republicans listened to us, and the Tea Partiers loved us. And we are all, all of us in the core group, are all liberals. Most of them are Democrats. And we were totally rejected by the Democratic Party. So it was a real eye-opening experience and exactly what Paul said. They don't like the fact that they're told what to do. They don't like the fact that they're being regulated. Now, they don't necessarily agree with anything that's going to touch jobs. So they're kind of like on the fence. It's like, which way should I go on this? Because I, I've got two, two dogs in this fight. So whether or not they will actually support us when the bill or when the initiative gets on the ballot, that's a different story. But they are fully behind us in getting the initiative on the ballot. Just a, a, a little vignette around the Housing Bill of Rights idea. I've been talking about with the housing rights activist groups in Portland now for two years. I've had no success. No success. So now, Why now, what's going on? Well, the housing activists are trying to get the state to stop preempting local governments from passing housing tenants' rights protections. Whereas through a community rights frame, 
you don't beg the state, you pass the law locally, even if the state preempts it, because you understand that we the people are sovereign, that we have authority over our state government. Again, it has duties and responsibilities to us, and when it's not following what we need, and Portland is in an emergency situa situation around housing, then even with an emergency, whatever that our mayor has put in place, emergency ordinance or whatever it's called, we still don't have the housing activist so-called leadership, I'm being very blunt here, taking the position that we need to do whatever we need to do to protect renters, homeless people, foreclosed people. We're still in the, in the same mode that you saw here, begging our state leaders to let us pass laws. And every state preempts its local governments because of state preemption and Dillon's rule from passing the laws that we need to pass. And we, we need to get out of what, what I describe and they describe in the film as the colonized mind. We need to decolonize ourselves and understand that we have authority. And that's what I was saying a few minutes ago. What does it look like for us to act as we the people? And to stop allowing these legal barriers to stop us. Let me be permitted one more here. In the communities in which you have been successful and the ordinances are currently standing, uh, to what extent do you think you have been able to instill a cultural change so that the cohesion and community rights view is instilled and will persist beyond the immediate issue? That's a great question. I actually think we've done very little successfully so far in the cultural change. I think for most residents in these communities, they see it as a terrific win still around that particular issue rather than this is a baby step towards something revolutionary. Yeah. Um, Community Rights US, this new organization that we're founding in a few weeks nationally, is planning to move in that exact direction that you just described, to take it beyond just let's get an ordinance passed and to start leading trainings on what does it actually mean to become we the people, to start embodying that. What does that feel like, smell like, experience like? Um, and I don't think any of us knows, but we're going we're gonna to do something like the women's consciousness raising groups um, that, at the rebirth of feminism in the 1970s, where women realized in small groups, the women, that they weren't crazy, that they were all having exactly the same experience, and that there was something structural going on that was oppressing them. And I think that's the direction that we need to head, is into culture shift work, and that's going to become a significant part of the work of Community Rights U.S when we launch in a couple of weeks. I'm just fascinated by this discussion. I, I grew up here, but have lived 41 years in South Carolina and just came back to live with my kids who moved here. And I was thinking this would be very appealing to a lot of people, but it would be the tea partiers. And it would go a different direction, I think, than you're actually thinking. My, my, my representative is actually Joe Eli Wilson, who of course doesn't represent me one bit. <laughs> but I mean, I'm willing to come and, if I can get transportation out there, I can, I'm, I'm willing to come and try it. I'd like to understand more when people ask these kinds of questions of feel I need to go to one of your schools to yes, really do. do it well or um, not be persuasive. Well, and this is crazy last timing, but thank you for that reminder that I'm actually leading a weekend workshop all day tomorrow and all day Sunday. And I have flyers if you're interested. Um, it's very short notice, obviously. Um, but it's affordable and there's still room for the workshop. And he hasn't paid me, he hasn't even asked me, to, but I will tell you, taking his class, it's going to be the best thing you ever did. It's going to be the best education about our country's history that you have ever heard because you haven't heard it this way. Because it takes it from the Constitution all the way up to present day and this step by step by step move taking power away from the people
and giving it to corporations you know they briefly mention that corporations used to look a lot different they actually had a limited lifespan corporations would only last for what ten years ten to thirty years and at the end of the specified time that was it you disbanded the corporation and it was gone look where we've gone from that so it is uh, getting late you know and thank you paul for being here and nancy for being here thank you so much and for all the audience for being here good questions and discussion but um it's time to say goodbye.